Washington, D.C. is one of the most photographed places every year in the U.S. and is one of the most visited places in the world. With its monuments, museums, and architecture taking center stage, the Capitol Building sits proudly atop the National Mall. It's one of the most iconic structures and most photographed in the entire District of Columbia. And yet, in any photo of the Capitol Building taken from the west above the horizon, sits in the background one of the largest abandoned stadiums in the country that hasn't seen an NFL game since 1996. RFK Stadium, located less than two miles from the Capitol, once intended to be a national stadium for all of America, and set to be the main site for presidential inaugurations and Olympic ceremonies, never saw these purposes realized, and instead saw championship games and iconic concerts in its day. Join me today as we explore the origins of this ambitious project, why its full potential was never realized, and how it still became an iconic venue only to become completely abandoned. My name is Lee Brees, and this is Modern Ruins, Episode 3. In America, it's hard to imagine city skylines without modern stadiums or arenas, and it's hard to imagine life without sports at all. In the early 1900s, the only major sporting event in the entire world was the Olympic Games, known today as the Summer Olympics. And being held only once every four years, countries coveted hosting the event and the international recognition the Games brought to their country. The United States was no exception. In 1916, Congressman George Holbert of New York proposed construction of a 50,000-seat stadium at East Potomac Park to attract the 1920 Olympics back to America, and specifically to the nation's capital, since the U.S. last hosted the Olympics in 1904 in St. Louis. Beyond the Olympics, it was thought the stadium could host tennis matches, polo tournaments, and the Army-Navy football game. It's worth noting that very few, if any, sports venues existed at this time that could hold more than 10,000 spectators, and the idea was very much unprecedented. This was also a time when the National Mall in Washington, D.C. was only beginning to take shape since reenacting the 1791 Law and Fault Plan, and many widely known structures on the mall today weren't built yet, such as the Lincoln Memorial constructed in 1922. Several other politicians caught wind of Holbert's idea and saw a greater potential for a national stadium meant for much more significant and patriotic events. D.C. Director of Public Buildings Ulysses Grant III and Congressman Hamilton Fisher of New York had the idea for a 100,000-seat stadium as a memorial to Theodore Roosevelt and would be fit to host events such as presidential inaugurations, suggesting it be on what is today Theodore Roosevelt Island or be a central figure on the National Mall which placed the stadium on the east side of the Capitol building, making it and the Lincoln Memorial bookend monuments on the mall. The idea was officially dead in 1932 when Congress chose not to fund the stadium in time to relocate the Olympic Games from Los Angeles. This is only the beginning of a larger pattern of why relying on government funding sucks. The idea gained new traction in 1938 when Robert Reynolds of North Carolina expressed frustration that the U.S. still lacked a modern stadium fit to host the Olympic Games. And the following year, the first model of what would become RFK Stadium was released, located very close to its modern site. By 1941, the National Capital Planning Commission began buying land for the project, and in 1944, the National Memorial Stadium Commission was created to further study the idea with the most recent theme behind the project being building the stadium as a memorial to veterans of the World Wars, with the commission recommending a 100,000-seat stadium near the current site of RFK be built in time for the 1948 Olympics, which failed to get funding. By the 1950s, both the NFL and MLB had become more established, and professional sports was beginning to become more and more of a significant aspect of American culture municipalities were beginning to see the economic potential of facilities built specifically for professional sports. In 1956, Congressman Charles Howell proposed legislation to once again construct a national stadium fit to host the Olympics. But after having been deliberated in Congress, the District of Columbia Stadium Act reduced the stadium down to a 50,000-seat venue meant to host the Washington Senators and Redskins. Lacking the grandeur and patriotic sentimentality that had kept the idea alive for 40 years to this point. Both teams were playing at nearby Griffith Stadium during this time. 
The act was signed into law by President Eisenhower on July 29, 1958, with leases being issued by the D.C. Armory and Department of the Interior to the two sports teams. The law suggested that construction of the stadium would cost between 7 and $9 million, but ended up costing more than $40 million. While there were several stadiums in existence that could host both baseball and football, the proposed stadium designed by architect George Dahl of Ewan Engineering Associates and Osborne Engineering was the first explicitly designed for this purpose and featured a cookie-cutter design that placed the football field along the first baseline and would become the standard for similar stadiums built over the coming decades. Ground was broke on July 8, 1960, and continued for 14 months. While multi-purpose stadiums deserve their own video, neither sport found the setup at all desirable, and for the most part, neither did fans, leading to their demise. The transition between football and baseball also proved to be costly, with the cost to transfer the new stadium back and forth being $40,000 per instance in $2,005. The stadium, however, was revolutionary and luxurious for the time, featuring 22-inch wide seats when the standard was 15.5 inches. It had air-conditioned locker rooms and had a machine-operated tarpaulin to cover the field in foul weather. The stadium also featured wider aisles and ramps that allowed the stadium to go from full to empty in 15 minutes, pneumatic tubes that connected the ticket office to the ticket windows, and several other notable features such as a 12,000-space parking lot, holding cell for drunks, and lounge for players' wives. Redskins owner George Preston Marshall was very much satisfied with the proposed stadium but the senator's owner, Calvin Griffith, was certainly not. Griffith was unsatisfied with the terms of the deal, and the financial figures of the ball club had suffered since the arrival of the Orioles in nearby Baltimore in 1954, and Griffith thought that the Minnesota market would be a more profitable venture for his team. In 1960, Minneapolis was granted an MLB expansion team, which Griffith then requested that his team move to Minnesota and the expansion team be given to Washington, which was granted. So when the Senators played their first game in the new stadium, it was a completely new team. District of Columbia Stadium, also known as D.C. Stadium, opened on October 1st, 1961, with a capacity of 49,219 fans for football. The stadium opened early for the NFL season since construction wouldn't be fully complete until the spring. The Redskins and Giants would play before nearly 37,000 fans, which beat the attendance record at Griffith Stadium. President John F. Kennedy was in attendance to watch the Giants overtake the Redskins 24-21. Six days later, George Washington University would become the first home team to score victory in the stadium, defeating Virginia Military Institute 30-6. And the stadium's first sellout would come later on November 23rd for the city title game, when the Catholic high school champion St. John's defeated the public high school champion Eastern 37-14. The stadium's first baseball game came on April 9, 1962, with President John F. Kennedy throwing out the ceremonial first pitch before 44,383 spectators, the largest sporting event ever held in Washington, D.C. at the time. The Senators defeated the Detroit Tigers 4-1, with Bob Johnson recording the first home run in the stadium. By the following NFL season, Redskins owner George Preston Marshall refused to integrate his football team and this resulted in President Kennedy issuing an executive order banning the team from playing at the stadium since it was technically federal land. Marshall eventually gave in, drafting a black player, Ernie Davis, who was soon traded, but Marshall would then hire five black Americans for his coaching staff, with the Redskins becoming the last NFL team to integrate. Throughout its first decade, D.C. Stadium would continue to host the city title game until 1963, when the game ended in a racially motivated riot just three days after the funeral of President John F. Kennedy, after which the annual high school football game was never played again. The George Washington University Colonials, an original tenant, disbanded their football program in 1966. D.C. Stadium would host the MLB All-Star Game in 1962 and 1969, but the Senators would leave Washington, D.C. in the fall of 1971 for Dallas and were renamed to the Texas Rangers. The Senators' last game, on September 30, 1971, suffered poor attendance below 15,000 fans due to predicted poor weather from Hurricane Ginger. The game proceeded with Frank Hondo Howard hitting the stadium's last home run for three and a half decades, but the game was forfeited to the Yankees 9-0 despite a Senators' 7-5 lead in the eighth inning 
due to unruly fans running onto the field with two out at the top of the ninth inning. In 1969, the stadium would go through its only name change, with the stadium being renamed to honor presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy, whom was assassinated seven months prior to the change, and brother of late President John F. Kennedy, with whom the stadium's name was originally supposed to be changed to in 1963, but Philadelphia's city council was able to pass a bill renaming their stadium after JFK before the Armory Board, who managed the stadium at the time, could take any action. With the departure of the Senators, several attempts were made to return baseball to RFK, including relocating the San Diego Padres, offering to host Baltimore Orioles home games, and several attempts to land expansion teams that all fell through. For the majority of the 1970s and 1980s, RFK Stadium became known for the success of its lone tenant, the Washington Redskins, who won three Super Bowls during that time, drawing national attention to the stadium for four NFC Championship games over that period and five overall in the stadium, three wins of which came over America's team, the Dallas Cowboys, and the final being over the Detroit Lions, who to this day have never returned to the NFC Championship game or have had much of any success at all. In addition to the Redskins' success of the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, the stadium played host to several notable concerts, including the Beatles, the Jacksons, Bruce Springsteen, the Grateful Dead, Billy Joel, and more, including a celebrity fundraising concert one month after 9-11 to raise funds for the victims of the attacks. And one of the stadium's more interesting events coming on November 29th, 1997, when more than 28,000 couples participated in a large marriage affirmation ceremony. Among other interesting events, Howard University also had a significant presence at the stadium, playing 42 games in 46 years, up until 2016. RFK also hosted boxing, Grand Prix motorsports in its parking lot, cycling, and rugby. With the loss of a second significant tenant and the Washington Senators and facing an eight-month annual dormancy, minor league soccer stepped in as a way to fill this void as the sport was slowly growing in popularity in the U.S. RFK started out hosting games for minor league soccer teams but had tremendous success going on to host the 1980 Soccer Bowl, the championship game for the North American Soccer League, with more than 50,000 in attendance. Soccer grew to become a significant use for the stadium, hosting World Cup matches in 1994 and early rounds of the 1996 Olympics. Yes, you can technically say the stadium was used for its original intended purpose despite its incredibly small role it played in the Olympics. After this success, the stadium was granted a Major League Soccer team in the DC United, who played their first game at RFK on April 20, 1996, in a 2-1 loss to the LA Galaxy. Despite the stadium's uptick in use with soccer, later in 1996, RFK's main tenant, the Washington Redskins, were finally able to leave the aging stadium, which was 35 years old at the time of the departure, and very old considering the lifespan of similar venues at the time. The Redskins had been working with Washington, D.C. and other officials for nearly 10 years to come to an agreement on a new stadium and eventually gave up on getting a new stadium built in D.C. and decided to move to Maryland to the infinitely better, luxurious, top-tier stadium of the NFL. Oh, wait. The Redskins at that time were also beginning to feel pressure on changing their name due to the racial undertones it had. And it was even more controversial that a for-profit enterprise with such a name was using federal lands for private profit. The Redskins won their last game at RFK Stadium, 37-10 over the Dallas Cowboys before 65,000 fans, well over max capacity, and the game remains the stadium's most attended event. The DC United were now RFK's lone tenant with minor soccer league teams trickling in and out over the next decade. RFK had hosted 16 exhibition baseball games since the Senators' departure in 1971, but baseball made a more stable return to RFK when the Montreal Expos of the MLB relocated to Washington, D.C. as the Washington Nationals. Weird, I know. After several dramatic seasons within the MLB, who originally planned to eliminate the team entirely, there was a brief consideration to revive the Senators' name, but the Texas Rangers technically still owned the naming rights and so the name was changed to Nationals to match the first American League team dating back to 1901. The Nationals were, however, able to acquire the rights to the Curly W logo from the Rangers, but the logo ended up looking very similar to the logo used by Walgreens, 
the U.S. drugstore chain, who chose to never sue despite frequent logo confusion. Walgreens releasing a statement saying that they never saw this as a significant issue to their business. Ah, if only all of corporate America thought this way. With the arrival of a new team, there were attempts made to bring sponsors on board and rename the stadium. With the Department of Defense being the title sponsor and using the sponsorship to promote recruiting, suggesting the stadium be renamed to Armed Forces Field at RFK Stadium, to which Congress quickly ended due to questions about the use of public funds to sponsor a stadium. RFK received a minimal facelift, and the Nationals would play three seasons at RFK Stadium from 2005 to 2008, until their new stadium, Nationals Park, was finished. The Nationals' first game at RFK opened to great fanfare, with 45,000 fans in attendance including President George Bush and MLB Commissioner Bud Selig. Bush would throw the opening pitch at the game, becoming the first president since Richard Nixon to do so at the stadium, Bush being a former part owner of the Texas Rangers, the former Senators. The Nationals would win their first game at RFK 5-3 over the Arizona Diamondbacks. Their last game on September 23, 2007, ended in another victory with the same score, this time over the Philadelphia Phillies. The Nationals would play their first game at the new National Park on March 30, 2008. DC United was once again the sole tenant of the nearly 50-year-old sports venue. Beginning in the same year, the stadium's only other feature event became the Military Bowl, a postseason bowl game for Division I NCAA football teams, but was relocated to Annapolis, Maryland in 2013. While the stadium remained used, the site's lone tenant simply didn't generate enough revenue to maintain the facility as it was needed, and the stadium sat idle and virtually abandoned when not in soccer season. In 2013, DC United, RFK's last tenant, announced in cooperation with the District of Columbia that they planned to build a $300 million, 20,000-seat stadium in Buzzard Point. And shortly after the announcement, RFK began hosting its final events. At the time... The land was in the hands of the National Park Service, who contracted with Events DC to run the venue. Events DC chose at this time to begin a strategic planning process about potential reuses or redevelopment of the stadium. The 190 acres, excluding portions used and operated by the neighboring armory, were very valuable pieces of land given the stadium's location. And Events DC focused on studying two specific scenarios for the aging venue, demolition and continuing to use the stadium as it is currently being so. The study results found that the stadium averaged about 4 to $5 million in revenue since 1997, which meant the stadium had been operating at a loss over that time. In 2014, Events DC contracted with a consulting firm, Brailsford and Dunlavey, to develop a master plan for the now empty complex. On July 4, 2015, Foo Fighters hosted the stadium's final concert, in celebration of the band's 20th anniversary. By February 2017, DC United broke ground on their new stadium, Audi Field, and at the end of the soccer season, RFK hosted its last sporting event. DC United would play their last match at RFK on October 22, 2017, losing 2-1 to the New York Red Bulls. By the end of the year, RFK had no main tenants, and became completely abandoned, awaiting its final fate or last chance savior. The consulting firm at Events DC decided at first to redevelop other areas on the campus. The first evidence of this came in 2019, when portions of the parking lot were converted into mixed-use turf fields at a cost of $30 million. On September 5, 2019, Events DC announced it was planning to demolish RFK Stadium by 2021, and began accepting bids from contractors. This would be pushed back to early 2022 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Events DC cited a $3.5 million in annual savings due to no longer needing to maintain the stadium or pay utilities. In September 2020, it was announced that Events DC had accepted a bid from a Rhode Island-based demolition company with an estimation to demolish the stadium set at $20 million. And demolition is still expected to begin in early 2022. The mayor of D.C., Events D.C., and the consulting firm have all stated that the best use of the space is to build a new arena or stadium on the land. And with the Washington football team unsatisfied with their current stadium and lease expiring in 2027, 
there is definitely a possibility that something could happen at the site, although the mayor has said that there have been no direct talks on the matter as of yet, but still wants an NFL team to return to the D.C. area. For now, the consulting firm and D.C. events said they are working on smaller projects in the meantime, including a mixed-use public market hall and a new memorial to Robert Kennedy, but it's likely that the site of RFK Stadium could remain bare for several years until a final determination has been reached on what to do with the property, and ultimately it's up to the federal government who owns the land, and lengthy debates in Congress could tie up the property's future even further. Even though the stadium never fully achieved its intended purpose after four separate attempts to make the project happen, it did host some Olympic events and the U.S. men's soccer team, which has no dedicated stadium in the U.S., played 21 games over the venue's life, more than any other venue across the country, which led many soccer enthusiasts to consider RFK to be the nation's de facto soccer stadium before its closure in 2019. RFK also became a cultural icon for locals of the D.C., Maryland, and Nova area who enjoyed its events for multiple generations. And Redskins fans look back on it fondly as the place where their team found so much success. RFK is yet another example of idealism and optimism, which runs thick in the American dream, but falls short of our hopes and dreams when met with reality. I really do hope that RFK is replaced with a new stadium, not necessarily with the grandeur of a national stadium like so many other countries have, but at least something that's economically sustainable and is comparable to some of the other architectural and engineering marvels in cities across the U.S. With the Washington football team's lease not ending until 2027 at their current stadium, it's likely we won't know any more than we do now about the future of RFK's site for quite a while. So for now, get your drones ready for demolition of one of the last entertainment complexes of its era, RFK Stadium. And on that note, thank you for watching. Subscribe to Labris TV for more Modern Ruins content. And be sure to comment what Modern Ruin you would like us to cover next.